Thanks for tuning in to the ABC Music Talk podcast, which is an insider's guide to the music industry, primarily aimed at new starters, but ultimately for anyone who has an interest in the business. This episode is part of the basics category, where my guest and I will do our best to demystify the dark art of neighbouring rights collections. But first, a reminder from my sponsor to go rotor your videos. Rota is for artists, managers, labels, or anyone in the music industry who needs to create video content for promotion or monetization. Rota makes it fast, easy, and inexpensive to do all of that in one place. Head to www.abcmusic.co and click the Rota logo on the homepage to access a 10% off discount for the service. My guest in this episode is someone who looks after one of my clients uh, for neighboring rights. But what on earth does that actually mean? To explain, Global Master Rights Operations Manager Matt Lever, welcome to the show. Hi, Alex. Cheers. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, I know. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually do this in person? It would be. It yeah. would be. It would, uh, it would uh, be certainly novel to be outside the house for a change. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's so again, this is one of those kind of COVID-19 lockdown type interviews. Uh, although actually, I mean, you are not in the UK, right? So the, potentially we would have done it this way. But uh, regardless, uh, if there are any technical issues, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's look at So, so you're, you're based in Holland, aren't you? Correct. Yeah, based in uh, the Netherlands, as I like to call it. Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. My, my apologies, listeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm almost, I'm almost touched now. Um, I live over here in the uh, lovely city of Utrecht, which is uh, roughly in the centre of the country. Uh, not too far from Amsterdam. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, obviously, uh, to uh, Amsterdam and uh, Utrecht. Yeah, I mean, always for for ADE, uh, of course, uh, which is correct. The, of course, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah of course. In fact, in fact, you and I—that was the first place you and I met up, wasn't it? Or was that? It was. Yeah. It was, uh, it was like that. Yeah. Was it? I think it was. Yeah. No, last year I think it was the first time. Um, I think we met up the one time when we sat and uh, we had a good chat at RDA and uh, kind of caught up and, and, and got to know one another. And um, no, RDA is a fantastic event, and I think it, it it's, um, really reflects you know how the Dutch industry, the Dutch music industry has grown uh, a lot. And it's got quite an international outlook, which of course fits in with the work that I do. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I enjoy living here, living with my Dutch girlfriend. Um, we live in, uh, yeah, a really nice city uh, called Utrecht. And, um, Worth a visit if you ever come over here. And uh, I've been here now, I think, around about seven years. And, and, um, and, so, and, and, and so did you follow the, you followed your girlfriend or was it a uh, job thing? How, how did you kind of... No, there, there, is, there is a really long, um, long story behind that, which I probably won't go into because I think you don't have time to... Uh, <laughs> to Maybe over a beer but, one day. Yeah, indeed. Um, but the, the short story is that I, um, I actually went travelling uh, for what I presumed to be one year and it ended up becoming a lot longer and I met my girlfriend overseas in New Zealand when I was backpacking and doing some um, sort of volunteer work and basically taking like a bit of a you know a sabbatical a year out and um, after traveling around for a few more years we finally decided to come back to back to reality and we moved over here and we've been together ever since nice. uh, so it's quite a, quite a nice way to have met and uh, yeah still going strong fortunately very good uh, and so how did you end up at gmr have you been in the music industry for a while i haven't actually no i'm actually relatively new new entrant so obviously i've been um, in it for now for i think it's about three over three years three and a half years and the story of how i came here was uh, i was working for a company in um in Utrecht. that's um a company that's not related to the music industry it's actually to do with of a meeting location kind of um, organization. And someone who worked there um, knows someone who is one of the directors at GMR. And she suggested that I might not be getting in contact with them because they were looking for someone with a little bit of my profile. I didn't I didn't have the knowledge at that time, but I had, you know, um, I had some of the skills that they were that they were interested in. We we had a chat and it was really laid back. It was just, you know just kind of give them a call and we, we talked about bands and, and the music we liked and probably 90% of the conversation was, you know, nice kind of music industry, kind of what, what are you into? And then 10% was, look, I think, you know, there's some areas that we overlap. Do you want to come and have a sit down with us? And I then had a, a chat with Eric and Paul, the, the two directors of the company where I work, and um, we really got on, we really hit it off. And uh, I, I found what they do was interesting, and 
I always had a little bit of a desire to work in the music industry. I worked in sort of financial services before that, um, and I've never never really followed it up. And I must say, I, I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I always found it a job that either you sort of went straight in and worked for, you know, a major label, or, or it was always, I, I would say, at least for me, I didn't, I didn't immediately see a pathway into the job, and it wasn't something that I had a really clear vision on, hey, I want to go and work in neighbouring rights, or, or I want to go and become a, a DJ, or what have you. So um, I, was, I always had a, a sort of an unfulfilled ambition that, yeah, I'd like to go and work in it. It seemed like a cool industry to work in with nice people, and obviously a fantastic product and that's how i ended up kind of meeting them and and you know showed the enthusiasm that they wanted to do the job and, and to learn um and it, and it opened doors and it you know it always opens doors for you um and that's how i ended up at gmr really just through through that through that relationship and, and, and doing a good job for a few months on a kind of a casual basis and then and come in and work for us full time. Right place at right time. That's uh, that's so unlike the music industry. Uh, of course, that's exactly how it is. Um, yeah. Good. And so and so GMR itself. Just uh, give us the, the the quick elevator pitch on on, on what the company mm. is and, and and so it stands for Global Master Rights. So I just want to get that accurate. correct. Yeah, yeah. It stands for Global Master Rights, um, and we're uh, an organisation that specialised in naming rights for uh, rights holders worldwide. So we specialise in looking after master owners. So master owners would be the rights holder on the label side. So that's the, the, the literal, you know, the, the, the owner of the master. So the person who is um, funding the recording of that, um, of that track and owns the master to it. And so in the main, we represent master owners, but we also represent some of forms, but that's sort of the, the, the secondary part of what we do. We, we started out primarily representing master owners. Um, and we represent them all over the world. We've got master owners from the US, from Canada, from Europe. Um, I'd say we represent quite a few in the Netherlands due to the fact that we've grown a hell of a lot in the last five, six years. Um, and we've still got quite a strong base in, in the Netherlands, which is, if you like, our home territory. But as the years go by, we, we're picking up master owners from, from all over the world, being in Australia, being in New Zealand. Um, and our, our job basically is to go out there and to ensure that you're collecting, or you're receiving, I should say, all of the rights that you're entitled to receive. So, naming the rights are generated where your works are exploited. So, the recordings that you own, where they're being exploited and played and used, you should be getting royalties for that. And so, our job is to go out there and make sure that they're registered in the right places, that they are. Um, all the all the works that you have are registered, and that the money you receive from every single territory, and that could be you know, anything from ten territories to you know forty or fifty, that the money you're getting is the right amount of money, and it's been paid through, and, and it's being uh, audited and checked, um, and and that you're getting what you what you're owed in effect. Very good. Okay, and uh, and uh, you've kind of started to go into uh, some of the other things. So I just want to sort of like slow it back down a little bit because I think that for some mm. people, some of the like the terminology might be you know just a little hard to kind of get their heads around. Sure. So so just to sort of start off uh, by explaining, I mean, typically the recorded music industry at least looks at yeah. uh, you know the master rights on the which are typically looked after by a record company and and it's also related to the recording artist and then you've got the kind mm. of the other side if you like uh the song mm. where you've got the publishers and the songwriters so neighboring rights it i think for a lot of people that that feels like well what's this kind of extra thing like what what is that to do with um so yeah. so but yeah. but that's to do with the master side right that's to do with so you're representing record companies a lot of the time right correct yeah so there is uh, there's a split between what are those two streams of rights? So to try and keep it simple, um, if you have a recording, you have on the one side, you've got those that contributed to the authorship of that recording. So that would be um, the people that wrote the uh, lyrics, the people that wrote the composition part of the music, and you would have normally a publisher. And as those that work in publishing would know, and perhaps for the listeners, they, you know, they don't know about that, you normally have a sort of a, 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 an equal split of, of, of those that are collecting. So it would be part goes to the publisher, a part goes to the person that wrote the lyrics, and a part goes to the person that wrote the, uh, the, the composer, the, 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 the music. Um, that's how it tends to work in publishing. And that's based on um, the side of 
the, 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 the authorship side of the work. Now there's a whole other right stream that falls, that, that there's been um, that part, um, that rights regime is older than the performance rights side. So to go one step back, we call it no rights, but it's also known as performance performance rights in some territories. And naming rights neighbors the, uh, the the composition, the author rights side, so hence it's neighboring. And this rights regime, we'll call it naming rights for the sake of this discussion, that's a relatively newer uh, invention. And it came about because there was an awareness that performers were performing on tracks for many years and they hadn't written it and they weren't a publisher. So they didn't have any recurring income going forward. And yet these recordings are being used and being exploited. Um, and it could be that as a, a musician or a session musician, you may have perhaps performed on a track and you may have got paid, you know, a couple of hundred dollars or what have you for that performance. But going forward, you had no you had no right at all to collect on your on your effort, on your contribution to that work. So the neighboring rights regime was uh, was created, um, and that's under the Rome Convention, and that was eventually uh, ratified by. I wouldn't be able to tell you head how many countries ratified it initially. It was it fifty or something like that? And once it's ratified, it's gone into force, and that allows the performers on that track to collect uh, royalties going forward. You know, in perpetuity. Not quite obviously because you have limitations on that, but. In effect, you've got the side that is the author side and the performance side. So those two rights streams are separate. So a publisher and the publishing side doesn't interrelate to the neighboring rights side. They're two separate streams and they've got different organizations that work to collect the money uh, and they they have different you know laws um, governing them. Sure. Um, so just to, I just thought this might be quite helpful in trying to sort of you know explain what what's going on. So on the on the so the PPL, which is the the UK based collection society uh, mm. for neighbouring rights, um, they talk about neighbouring rights and they explain it this way: it's the different rights sort of associated with the right to play recorded music in public, the right to broadcast recorded music, e.g. on TV and radio, and the right to copy mm. recorded music for the purposes of playing it in a public or broadcasting it. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I just kind of wanted to sort of say that because I think that's it was a fairly neat way of kind of putting it together, right? And and that's also, that, that's what yeah. we that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Um, Correct. Yeah, I, I was probably getting a bit uh, technical, but yeah, well, effectively we're talking about the right to exactly broadcast and and exploit those works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and I think I think it gets confusing because, of course, as you pointed out, this concept of neighbouring is because the same exploitation sort of moment in time. Is, mm. is creating revenue for both the songwriters and, and the recording artists, yeah. Indeed, yeah, and I think that gets quite com uh, confusing for a performer especially because it can feel as if, well, aren't these the same things? And we often have the question that, well, if I, you know, enter into an agreement with you guys, is that gonna, not going to affect my publishing? And in a, in a way, it does feel the same thing because you're talking about a recording. It could be a digital one, it could be a, a physical CD or vinyl, and in some ways you, you it's tempting to think, oh, this is, you know, I'm getting the money that I'm due, but it is two separate streams of income um, and two separate rights. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Very good. Well, I, th I think that I think that explains it pretty well. Um, I mean, I'm going to put some I'm going to try and dig out some uh, some links and put them in the in the show notes to try and just guide people if, if they want to dig a little further onto it. Um, it's very difficult to kind of do this sort of over a podcast, I'll be honest with you. No, um, sure. so, so let's let's talk a little bit more about some of the other sort of aspects to, to kind of your world. So GMR's a, an agent. Um, can you just explain the kind of the difference between how you guys operate and say perhaps like working directly with a, a collection society like the, the UK one PPL? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so where we differ to a collection society would be that a collection society is an entity uh, which is appointed within one country, normally exclusively, not always, and they're legally mandated and have an exclusive right to collect and manage neighbouring rights within that territory. So for example, PPL in the UK is responsible for managing the, uh, the collection of income. It's responsible for ensuring that most of the performers uh, and, and master owners will, will receive income. It's working with broadcasters, ensuring that they're paying a tariff for the works that they use. And it's also working with um, users in the, 
in terms of sort of public performance that will be um, using it in, for example, a, a, a waiting room or what have you, uh, shop. We differ from that in that we're not represented in one territory. We, we're an agent, we're not sort of a, um, a CMO in, in, in that respect. Uh, we don't we don't have a legal mandate for one particular country. We operate within multiple different territories as a as an agent, and we represent our rights holders to ensure that they collect in every territory. How the CMO world is sort of evolved is you have a PPL, if you like, in every single uh, in every single country. Um, they work pretty well, but and and I think they do a very good job within the country where they're based. But we work very effectively by working with all of them in every different territory and coordinating that effort and ensuring that all the money that rights holders should be getting is uh, is picked up. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I know that that was the sales pitch, if you like, that I think there is a reason why my, my client went with you. You know, that it's that sort yeah. of like, that's, I suppose the thing is that you have a slightly more commercial remit, right? You're you're going to fight the yeah. corner a little bit, bit harder, I think, in certain areas. That, that At least that was yeah. kind of what I interpreted it. Yeah, obviously, it's, uh, it, it's, I have to tread a bit carefully because I don't want to be seen to be criticizing the CMOs at all um, because we work with them very closely and we have a really good relationship with them. Um, we can't do our job and we can't represent rights holders if we don't get on with a CMO. And likewise, you know, they, they do and they should want to work with us to ensure that the money that they're, uh, um, you know, setting aside for the correct rights holder is. Is being um, paid out, and I, I, I must say that you're, you're correct. And if you like the sales pitch, and how we tend to work is, I probably should have elaborated a bit on that. Is that we work really very closely with all the CMOs. So the only difference would be is that if you take, you know, um, uh, you know, a record label, whatever, ABC Records, if you like, um, they could go and, and they could give, um, they could go and work with, you know, Sam Exchange or, or PPL, and they could give them a mandate. But in our experience, as good a job as Sound Exchange and PPL do in their own domestic market, it doesn't always work effectively when they're going to other CMOs and collecting on behalf of their rights holders. And why it doesn't work is a pretty complicated story, but effectively you've got lots of different organizations with different sort of IT systems, different stands, different ways of working. Um, and they also have... I think relatively few resources for the job that they're being asked to do. So it's really difficult for them to take care of all of those different jobs and to put the right people in place to ensure that international collections are also being cut paid through. Um, and what we do is we get on with all the different CMOs, that's part of our job, and, and, and they work pretty effectively with us. And we go and we adapt our approach to every market and we go and we say, look, what do you need from us? What kind of data do you require? How do you need us to register stuff? Um, what kind of software do you work with? How can we adapt that to, um, to, to our needs or to your needs? And ultimately, we ensure that we're delivering the right stuff and that pays out on behalf of the right holders. So a bit of a waffly answer, but no, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think, think you're right. Quite, that was quite diplomatic, <laughs> actually. I thought it was yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, it, it, it's really important that um, that we work with the CMOs, and and I think I must say my experience with them is always really good. Um, some are easier to work with than others. I think that's like a, also like a cultural thing, you know. But you see that with um, with with you kind of reflect like a. a I mean, I, I sort of be careful what I say here, but you see a culture reflecting in how some of these organisations work. So some are really open, and others are a bit more you know, closed and, and take a bit more time to work your way in and, and, and to get to know how they how they work and, and how you need to communicate with them. And I think that's part of, you know, part of being in the music industry as well as being like a people person. I think that's in my relatively short time in the job. Uh, if you get on with people and you're able to um, adapt and you're able to sort of empathise, I think that's also a big part of the job, at least from my experience, that it's a very... It's a very people-driven industry and a very people-driven world, even down, I, I guess, I've not done it at an artist management level. But, you know, if you don't connect with someone and you can't find common ground, then um, then it's going to be it's going to be hard work. Um, it's, it's, so that's how we've had success. Yeah, that, that's certainly, I've noticed that because obviously I work with you not on a daily basis, but whenever we need to, right? And uh, mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. I can come to you and how I've met you and it, it certainly makes all the difference when we're trying to problem solve, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. That's Definitely. great. So uh, 
one of the things I also like about uh, your companies, you have a, a you know a nice platform. You have quite a nice uh, dashboard, for example, to help sort of like really sort of understand kind of what's going on mm. know, in terms of like the different collections, and you've got kind of different global maps and things like that. So, yeah. so I mean, how? So because it's it's one of those things within like my world, if you like, on the sort of digital distribution that that side that that people have put an awful lot of emphasis on. And of course, mm. for a little while now, we've had daily trend data coming through and that's very very key and very very important now obviously neighboring rights isn't quite at that stage yet is it no no that's a really uh, that's a really good point yeah i do think that the the tech element and and sort of bringing in that um that that granular detail of 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 data and trends is something that um we in the music uh, and the neighboring rights world i should say have been a wee bit slow to adapt um, it's something that we are working actively with, with third parties. Um, so we will go to um, organizations that collect airplay data and we work with um, multiple airplay data organizations and we try to cross check uh, whatever we're receiving from a collection society with the data that we're getting from these uh, companies. And the more data you have, the more effective you can check and cross check and I, I, I should say that I think some of the CMOs have started to adapt and have started to come up with tools that let you do that but there are there is still a little bit of a kind of a working on Excel culture within um, some of the CMOs some of them don't have any other option of course because if you're talking about some of the smaller countries they only have a few um, people working there and they, they just don't have the resources to have a huge IT department coming up with apps. But I think there is also at times maybe a lack of willingness to change the way that um, they're working. And I think that's where we've been able to come in as well. And, and we're not the only agent out there. I'm not going to name any of our competitors. No, I don't think you should. Absolutely no, no, so, so, Someone could go out and, and, and find them, of course. And I think some of those have also leaned on the CMOs to try and be, um, to try and, you know, update the offering in terms of the data that they're allowing you to have, the tools that you can use to just dive in a bit deeper and to ensure that all the tracks that are out there are being collected on. Because it, without, I don't want to get into a sort of a too technical discussion about it, but it's interesting to look at how CMOs actually work and how they, and how they actually, how does it work? How is the data managed? How do you match songs? And in, in really simple terms, what you have is you effectively have we will represent, say, a performer or a label. We will have a, a, a dump of data. So, you know, we'll have a load of metadata, and that will be a recording title, artist names, ISRCs, which is like, like a code uh, that we're using in, within this part of the music industry. You have recording year, uh, you might have a genre, you might have duration. You know, there's an endless amount of sort of markers that you can have. And we will store that and we will go to the CMO and we'll ask them effectively to match that with their data. And how that matching takes place, uh, how effectively you match it, that sort of decides when the numbers are crunched, what you're going to earn and what you're going to generate on behalf of the rights holders. And if you just run that once, then you might get you know, a 50-60% match. But the question is, that CMO, uh, what data points are are they accounting for differences in the uh, ordering of words? Are they including different types of grammar and punctuation within the match? Are they accounting for um, uh, misspellings? So once you start to dive into that whole sort of data, met metadata side of it, that's when you can really start to make a difference on behalf of the right holder, because the more work you put into that, and the more resources and the more expertise you have in that, then you're going to match more effectively and you're going to deliver more income for the rights holder. So it's that side of the job that we've worked hard on developing the right sort of tools um, and, and the right sort of knowledge within our team. Um, and it is becoming a more, a term more data driven, um, a more data driven world. And I think that's what you see in, I mean, the wider music industry as well, like you're obviously working sort of the, the digital distribution model, it's the same kind of thing. And, and the more we go in that direction, the more you're going to have to have the right kind of knowledge and the right kind of uh, uh, tools to, 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 make that, to make that work, because that's the way that the industry is going, especially with the whole blockchain world that I won't pretend that I fully understand or, or, or how all of that works. I'm not an IT person, but 
I can imagine that in 10, 10 years or so, 20 years, it's going to be even more data, um, a, a, a data driven world in that regard. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I think it's going to be one of the big sort of in, sort of areas that the industry will have to continually innovate around, for sure. Yeah. Data collection and processing. Um, okay. So one of the one of, one of the things that I think in working with you, I've really kind of had highlighted, I think, is the the difference in, in sort of the efficiencies around the countries themselves and, and the kind of, mm -hmm. so like UK, Australia, Germany, they're, they're kind of sort of top of the list, right? And then it all starts to kind yeah. of fall away a little bit. Can, can you talk a little bit more about kind of some of the complications perhaps around collection, administration, maybe even some of the differences in the sort of the, the rights that are actually enforceable or, or applicable in, e in each of these countries? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so not, every, you... not every country. It will be, it'll be no, the longest no, podcast yeah. in the world ever. But <laughs> just, <laughs> just get a few, a few examples of points of difference. Yeah, no, sure. Um, so to, to give you an example, obviously, um, PPO, for example, is uh, one of the CMOs, uh, collective management organizations that's been around for the longest, like I wouldn't be able to exactly when they started. I think it was in, like, I think in the current form, maybe in the nineties. I think before that, it was perhaps um, it, it wasn't PPO. The PPO as we know it now has it's been around, I guess, twenty years or so, something like that. They work exclusively in the UK. They work under the UK uh, law and regulation pertaining to neighbouring rights, and because they have the resources to do it, they've got a pretty good you know, uh, IT system in place. If you compare that to, say, a country that has a much uh, younger CMO that has less resources to do it, then they're going to struggle to to replicate the kind of performance that you would get from one of the, the biggest CMOs. However, there are also there are also different factors at work in terms of how the CMOs are structured within each country. So, for example, in Italy, you have um, a slightly different relationship. You have CMOs that can actually be set up and they can collect um, sort of under license, but you don't necessarily have one CMO that's appointed to collect in that country like you would have people in the UK. People in the UK is collecting for both performers and for master owners, so it's collecting for both sides of the living rights pie. Whereas in other countries, you have one CMO that collects for the performer side and one CMO that collects for the master owner side. So they're two different organizations. That's the case in uh, Belgium, where you have Playwright for the performers and Simin, which collects for the master owners. And in other countries, you have three or four that collect on behalf of the performers and one or two that collect behalf, on behalf of rights holders. Um, so the picture gets more complicated depending on what country you go to. If you look at Russia, it's again a bit more complicated because there you don't necessarily have one government appointed um, CMO. You have multiple CMOs that have the, uh, um, the mandate, the right to collect at any one time. It's the same as in India, where I recently had a conversation with someone that we work with in India. And again, it's quite a complicated picture there that um, there's a bit of a struggle, shall we say, between different CMOs as to who should be collecting and who has the right to do it. Um, in Brazil, you have multiple CMOs that sit under ACAT, which is the organization which distribute the funds, but who you work with might dictate how much money you can collect. So in some countries, it's very, very sort of clean. I mean, in the Netherlands, you have Senna, and Senna works really effectively, like the PPL does to collect on both sides. You have the performers and you have the rights holders. Uh, and in other countries, you have multiple CMOs who, if you like, competing. So the structure you have in place really dictates the extent to which we can work with the, the organizations and collect effectively. Because with one organization, it takes far less resources to go there and to deliver what you need and to, and to, and to get things set up correctly. If you've got multiple organizations, then it's going to be a much more difficult job. Um, so we obviously can't change that. We have to work with what is there and, and what we have. And so we make the, you know, we, we, we do our best to try and um, strive work with all of them, but it is it is really difficult. And of course, in some countries, you've got a, a relatively new picture. You know, if you're talking about developing countries, be that in Africa, for example, um, you know, we all know that these countries don't necessarily have the resources to have a large CMO that can have uh, huge IT systems and, and the knowledge in-house. So again, you have to, temporary expectations to understand that 
what's possible there isn't going to be the same as what's possible in the US. I should actually point out the US is an interesting one that's triggered me to, to say that obviously the US isn't um, a signature to the Rome Convention. So in effect, the US doesn't have the same rules that you have in place in a lot of the European countries. So naming rights there isn't collected on normal um, radio transmissions. It's only paid through on a digital radio transmission. So whilst the market in the US is very big, um, it's actually a fraction of the size it would be if um, if it was uh, if it was extended to to um, to, uh, to normal radio transmission. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, that, and I think you know, that that's the one that kind of is very difficult for people that work English language parts of the music industry because, of course, the US and the UK are you know so close in terms of sort of where, how they share how they share music and often resources and relationships and, you know, offices and all the rest of it. And, uh, and it's, it's certainly that, that is kind of an area that it would certainly with regards to neighboring rights that it becomes very confusing very quickly because of the way that they work yeah. very differently. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think that the thing with neighboring rights is that, um, I think it's actually not that different to publishing. I mean, I've not worked in publishing, but I have had some conversations with people that, have worked it, and I think it's not too dissimilar that you know it's a relatively I wouldn't say antiquated system, but because you know, oh, the, the, I, I think you can I think you can use that term. I think that's completely fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I had yeah. a I had I had Chris uh, Miam, who's the CEO of Centric Music, a very large UK pu based publisher, and uh, yeah, he, he was. <laughs> He was explaining that the the you know the process of data transfer is kind of like free text fields. That's kind of how. Yeah, they're... indeed. Yeah, and and some of them uh, I'm not going to name the CMO, but some of them are working with kind of like DOS level yeah, exactly. you know, software. Yeah. Which and I wouldn't say that whole system's based on that, but sometimes you're delivering stuff in a very old fashioned way, and yeah, it's really inefficient. Um, and it's not what we should be doing in the music industry if we want to modernize, if we want to work more efficiently and if we want to sort of project a project an image of an industry that's that's up to date and, and modern because you've got on the one side you've got a shiny fantastic platform like Spotify but on the other hand the back end which is part of what naming rights is is really outdated and, and not working efficiently. So I know there are moves to um to 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 get the CMOs working together. Um, there there is some um, so there's v VRDV, I believe it's called, which is kind of um, um, a collaboration between the CMOs to ensure that some kind of platform is built where they're going to share uh, the, the IT um, the IT uh, standards so that we're working to one set of rules about how data is stored, how data is shared, etc. And I think that perhaps one day, if that you know comes to fruition, it will offer a much more seamless experience for you know, the likes of GMR and even the rights holders that sit under CMOs, and it will be far easier and far more efficient. I'm not aware of how far that's gone yet. I'm not within the CMO, but the people that I've spoken to seem to be reasonably optimistic that perhaps if it comes along and, and, and is a fantastic success, you know, we'll be out of a job for GMR. Uh, I doubt it, I hope not, <laughs> um, but I doubt it. I think there'll always be space for, you know, um, a fleet-footed operator to work between the, the, the CMOs to make sure they're, um, you know, they're being they're, they're working effectively. But I think if the CMOs were to work together a bit more on that regard and to, to share things a bit more, perhaps we would see, you know, uh, less energy having to be spent on just the basics of delivering data, on on getting data out of the database, on matching stuff, on ensuring that rather than saving a song ten times. We have one golden copy of that recording, and that we're all using that. Um, and that sort of goes even further back to when how ISRCs were created and the way that they were uh, devised, and the fact that you know a record label, a major label, can create its own ISRC. And of course, then you have multiple versions of ISRCs in every database, and what one's the right one? Um, no, well, the, 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 this one is other than that one, and, and the whole thing becomes a mess. So I understand why it was developed that way, and, and uh, I'm not a data scientist, but I think if you look at it now, it's it's ripe for consolidation in some way. Need, needs an update. 
It does, yeah. I, I think if, yeah, I mean, if the, yeah. yeah, I mean, I so I mean, just to sort of as a sort of an aside to all of this, I mean, I I live through the kind of the the evolution, if you like, of data transfer for uh, for DSPs and and record companies and kind of how they were working together, and that sort of was the that that's what we now refer to as uh, the digital data exchange, the DDEX standards, um, because yes, I mean, in yeah. the early days. It was kind of everything from you'd have maybe like a, a CMS that you'd ask uh, a record label to, to go on and type their data into if you're if you're you know a download service as they were in, in those days, to mm. send us an Excel spreadsheet with some data yeah. in, to yeah. send me this XML format with this you know, and oh what do you mean by featured artist? Well you know I mean this. Well how am I supposed to know that that's what you mean right? And so the sort yeah. of the standard. Yeah piece of it was very very important i had a, a, a you know some involvement with with the kind of the evolution of that and it does feel that that's perhaps a, that sort of renaissance period that we might need in, in neighboring rights collections yeah i think so i think um definitely uh, when you look at the digital distribution side i must say it's kind of been driven as well by companies like say you know believe digital um by you know the, um, uh, the platforms that are using it such as spotify but also you know, Google, et cetera. Um, yeah, all of them, I mean, there's many out there now, but what they've done is they've come up with a more efficient model for ensuring that the data is managed in a, in, in a way that is um, yeah, like an IT-based approach. And I think what you have in Navy Rights is not so much an IT-based approach, more of an approach based on you know, how can we adapt the IT approach to fit the way we store our data rather than the other way. What would be the most efficient way to work with the data? Um, but I think that's also kind of to be expected because, um, I'm not, again, I'm not an IT expert, but we're not coming at it, you know, from a, from a labor rights point of view. It's organizations that have evolved and worked with, you know, contracts and paperwork. And, and when you have to then move to working in a sort of a digital way, it's quite a change that you have to put in place in an organization. And I think that's something that will take some time to come to fruition. But I think the wheels are in motion and that we're slowly seeing that. And as I said, it, if the whole blockchain technology really does take off as, as people are claiming it will, then that could be the big transformation uh, and, and CMOs are, are then working in a, a, a completely different way or effectively purely putting putting you know income through them and making sure it goes in the right place. But otherwise the data is going to be matched on a more on a sort of blockchain level, but yeah, I'm sort of speculating here about my debt. Yeah, I, right. so I, I know just enough to be dangerous about that sort of stuff, and uh, I think we, we are no we, more than me. Then, yeah. we, we, we are a long way from that actually being implemented yeah. to anything even remotely useful for the music industry. But uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, as you say, who knows, right? Um, but I, I feel like that was a fairly positive message by which to end. Uh, so just want to say a yeah. big thank you for for coming on and sharing uh, sharing your experiences and, and your knowledge. That's been super helpful. Really appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> pleasure. Pleasure to uh, pleasure to be on. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, so to my listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, as ever, I welcome all feedback, comments and suggestions on future shows. My Twitter handle is at Alex Branson. Just put podcast DM in a message and I'll follow you back and we'll have a dialogue or head to the website, which is www.abcmusic.co and you'll find a contacts page there where I've got my email address on. Well, thank you very much.